Hello, everybody. I'm Dick Clay, and I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad you've joined us for today's presentation, The Work of Fashion, Laboring Women, and the Politics of Dress. Our speaker is Dr. Anev Rabinovich Fox. She teaches United States and women's and gender history at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio. Her undergraduate degree is from the University of Tel Aviv. She is a native of Israel. Her PhD is from New York University and she holds joint Israeli-American citizenship. Um, her research examines the connections between fashion, politics, and modernity, particularly how visual and material culture have shaped and reflected class, gender, and racial identities. Her writing appeared both in scholarly journals and books, as well as venues such as the Washington Post, PBS, and The Conversation. Her book, Dressed for Freedom, the Fashionable Politics of American Feminism explores how people used fashion to challenge race and gender identities and to promote feminist agendas in the long 20th century. I'll return to moderate questions after the presentation as time permits. You'll also see that at the end of her presentation, there'll be information on how to purchase her book. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Anev Rabinovich Fox. Dr. Fox, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, and thank you for this invitation and um, introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy uh, to see you, all of you and uh, to uh, have you come, at least virtually, uh, to this talk. I'm, uh, uh, really sorry we can do it in person, but uh, with all the uncertainties of our time, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to have this talk and to continue, uh, even if only uh, remotely. And again, I want to thank uh, Richard and Scott and everyone in the Filson um, for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to come and talk to you today. Um, I will uh, start my um, presentation uh, now. So uh, share my PowerPoint. So bear with me for just a second. I hope you all good. Um, so today, um, I want uh, to talk about the ways in which fashion and labor and women's work are connected and really to celebrate um, both uh, the uh, wonderful exhibition that the Filson has that I hope that you got the chance to see it or you will uh, have a chance to see it virtually, uh, the exhibition Women at Work, Venturing into the Public Sphere, and as Richard um, mentioned, um, also the publication of my book, uh, Dress for Freedom, the Fashionable Politics of American Feminism. Um, I um, want to have kind of like a quick uh, self-promotion uh, moment uh, and uh, to let you know that if you uh, like what you hear today and you want to read about it more, you can purchase my book um, either uh, through Amazon or other uh, retailers that sells books or through uh, the university uh, press, University of Illinois Press, uh, where you can get also 30% uh, off, and I think all the information will be at the end of the presentation and in the chat. Um, and you can always contact me uh, through my email. And um, I'm sorry I cannot uh, assign your book uh, personally, but if you send me your uh, address, I promise to send you free of charge um, a bit of a, a signed book, book plate. So at least you'll have a, a something, uh, if not um, in person. Um, so really to think about my book, uh, it examines the connection uh, between fashion and politics and especially how fashion 
was integral part of the feminist movement during the long 20th century. And I show how development in clothing design and manufacturing provided women, um, especially those who were barred from positions of power due to their class or race, uh, with accessible means to shape modern ideas of gender and sexuality, and uh, to claim a more equal place in the public sphere. Uh, the book traces the sartorial practices of well-known activists and ordinary women representing various backgrounds and experiences. So working class, middle class, black and white, urban and suburban, those who identified as feminists and those who did not. These women, by adopting and adapting the mainstream styles, turn fashion into a useful mean to promote feminist agenda and to redefine feminist politics. Yet today, I want to focus on, on uh, one of the aspects of, uh, that I talk about in the book and how is it uh, women's work and women's workers, uh, both in the fashion industry and beyond, change the way we dress. And indeed, far from being frivolous or a marginal uh, issue, clothing and appearance uh, were central to women's ability to venture into the public sphere. Uh, to gaining power and a voice in public, but also central to their experiences in public spaces. The weight of clothes, the tightness of the undergarments, the length of the skirt, and really uh, just the overall uh, sense of clothes over one's body were all major fa factors in uh, determining women's experiences and physical movement um, and the activities they could perform. And as you can imagine, as women began entering uh, the workplace in larger numbers in the late 19th century, uh, these fashion also went through major changes. And I think it will not be difficult uh, to convince all of you um, that our work has immense influence um, on our wardrobes. Um, if anything, the last two years have taught us um, really what it means, right? Uh, the pandemic already changed the way we dress uh, when we went into lockdown in March uh, 2020. Uh, we all moved in our, to a loungewear. Uh, many of us uh, abandoned our bras. Some of us abandoned pants. Um, most of us stopped wearing shoes, right? And unsurprisingly, uh, sales of makeup, formal wear, high heels all went down. Um, and uh, as we got used to work from home, uh, the fashion industry also um, adjusted um, in one sense, right? And offer us really solutions to this new reality. And now, I mean, maybe Omicron is kind of like delaying this return, but, um, but as we are do returning to work and workspaces, um, we also see a trend of how uh, more casual wear is now uh, the style than ever before. Workers are no longer willing to put up with uh, underwire bras, jackets, ties. Um, all those former well seem uh, really a, a relic of the past. And we are really um, uh, opting um, into comfort, comfort. So it's really interesting to see how the pandemic uh, will change uh, workwear um, in the years to come. But, and, and really there is a strong relationship with uh, fashion industry and really women's work. I mean, men work too, and men uh, uh, dress uh, changes too, but uh, women, uh, women clothes really uh, went through a, a, a transformation once we began to think about women as workers. Um, more than a century ago in the 19th century, the late 19th century, um, the United States really experienced a rise of a new mass and uh, a new mass market, a new mass culture that really reshaped uh, social, political, and economic relationships. Uh, changes in transportation, developments in technologies, um, as well as shifting uh, trends of immigration and labor, uh, brought with them restructuring of businesses um, and a search of mass production that usher really a modern era of consumption. More women than ever before uh, began to enjoy the growing opportunities of education, of work, and leisure, and they went out 
to the street and they looked for clothes that will suit this new lifestyle and activities um, that came with it. Um, and when we think about clothes uh, for much of the 19th century, uh, when we talk about fashion, we really talk about kind of like the rum of the rich and famous, right? Uh, the elites and the middle class. Uh, women clothes were often uh, custom made to specific occasions and also to specific bodies. Um, uh, either by going to a dressmaker, a professional dressmaker, or if you had less means, uh, the home sewer, uh, most women knew how to sew, uh, could use using sewing patterns uh, to construct their own dress. Um, and while the very famous and rich elites could afford to go to Europe um, or to um, and to go to the designers there, Worth, Doucet, uh, Maison de Félix, uh, the whole uh, famous Parisian uh, uh, designers, um, or uh, to the big metropolitan, uh, metropolitan uh, cities like New York and Chicago that are also becoming uh, fashion centers. Um, rural elites or small towns elites uh, oftentimes uh, could not uh, venture into those places, but they still got their couture designs uh, from local dressmakers. Um, but that uh, took away uh, the French styles that are now being disseminated through magazines, uh, through sewing patterns and make them. Um, so they're uh, really wearing French, French styles, American made at home. And that's what uh, most kind of like were middle class and kind of like more rural e elites wore. So kind of like uh, Louisville is a good um, example of, of such a place. And uh, professional dressmaking, um, as you can imagine, um, proved to be a lucrative business uh, for many women, as it did not require um, a lot of money to start a business um, or a lot of resources. Um, and you can really, I mean, if you would see the exhibition, you would see uh, a few examples of that, of local dressmakers who really uh, turn it into their profession. Um, this was especially true, uh, though, for African Americans, whom uh, both during and after slavery, um, the dressmaking trade offered them um, a route for economic mobility, providing them uh, with autonomy and a venue uh, to express their creativity. Uh, maybe most famously, um, dressmaking uh, allowed for enslaved women uh, to buy their freedom. Elizabeth Cackley uh, bought her way to freedom and her son's freedom uh, through her dressmaking skills. Uh, she moved from St. Louis to Washington, D.C., uh, accumulating a long list of customers, um, among them, of course, Mary Todd Lincoln. And she really took her uh, dressmaking trade as a way, um, as a route to freedom. But even after emancipation, uh, dressmaking uh, was seen as a profession that could um, advance African American. In 1893, uh, civil rights activist Mary Church Jarrell called for the establishment of vocational education for girls in dressmaking and millinery as a way to improve their social position. And many had heard to this call and between 1900s and 1910, the proportion of black women in domestic work, which was always um, the most common occupation uh, for black women, uh, it dropped from 92 to 48% um, as the numbers of seamstress, dressmakers, tailorists, and millionaires went up. So it was really a way for them um, not only to gain profession, but also to gain economic wealth. And dressmaking, which could be done at home with a rental or a buying of a sewing machine, proved especially attractive uh, occupation um, also in the 20th century to many new migrants and during the Great Migration when they moved to the North and the Midwest. New York, the uh, nation's fashion capital, became a center for African-American designers who found the aspiring class of Harlem 
and its growing entertainment scene as a good place uh, and source of customers. Yet other cities were also welcoming for black, black designers, either working as a wage earners uh, for someone else in one studio or opening their own business. Black designers such as Anne Lowe, Zelda Wynn, and Amanda Wicker found fashion a great way to make a career. And, um, and again, although many of them cater to the Black community, they also manage um, to go and to verge into white clients. And Lowe was, became, became very famous in designing the wedding dress of Jacqueline Bouvier in her wedding to JFK. And um, Black women were also and always part of the industry. And that's something that it's important to, remind, to remember uh, when we think about um, who, who were the women's uh, designers behind the clothes. And um, many women who entered the trade in the late 19 and early 20th century were really self-taught. Um, but by 1930, um, designers came to the profession with uh, an official uh, education, um, part of kind of like, again, the call of Terrell to uh, invest in vocational uh, schools. Uh, that was true to, to all uh, groups of the population. And really, uh, uh, fashion design became a more uh, skilled professional career. Um, and it became one of the popular, uh, most popular routes for careers for women, uh, both white and non-white, um, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, they were considered more qualified to work in this line of work due to their uh, feminine uh, sense of style. And women managed to achieve position of power and influence in this um, field in ways that they couldn't done in other uh, male-dominated business. By 1940, um, almost 84% of women executives um, in this country uh, were uh, a part of a fashion related field. So um, you can see how this uh, field really became uh, a source for career for women. And unlike French couture, um, much of the fashion industry uh, was based on ready-made um, and retail. And thus most designers were really anonymous um, to uh, the, um, to the common consumer. And that's partly of why African-American women uh, were able to uh, be part of that business because a lot of, uh, a lot of consumers did not know who, um, who designed their clothes. So employers were more willing to hire black women um, even despite of segregation, despite of discrimination. Um, this was a field that they, that the anonymity actually uh, worked um, in their favor. Um, but um, by the 30s, with the Great Depression, um, and more forcefully uh, by World War II, uh, there was more emphasis on American design as a way to promote national pride and patriotism, and with it, a more emphasis also on the American designers. Um, in particular, the industry promoted women designers, um, turning them into a new role model of the modern American woman. Um, in 1932, wow. sorry, um, uh, Dorothy Shaver, who was then uh, the new vice president of the department store, Lord and Taylor, um, orchestrated an American fashion for American women campaign, marketing American designers in an attempt to boost sales. And in its first year, the store featured the work of Elizabeth Hawes, Annette Simpson, and Edie Roos. And subsequent years, um, introduced Claire Potter, Claire McCardle, Muriel King, and Bonnie Cashin. And maybe these names are not that familiar to you today, but they were um, a really uh, known um, at the time. Um, they were the first American designers to really be known by name. Um, and, um, and unfortunately, maybe today they are forgotten, but kind of like in fashion circles, these names are certainly uh, familiar. But making these names known um, to the public for the first time 
um, the American Fashions Campaign really sought to create this cult of personality um, around uh, American fashion designers, similar to the one that was around French designers, and amplifying the message that these fashion were made by and for women. And indeed, the, fashion, the female designer became the ultimate role model uh, of a cons and a consumer of a style that fitted uh, what they called the bright, resourceful, daring, and unprejudiced young woman, really kind of like the ideal American woman, um, incorporating both strong and independent mind, but also feminine beauty. And this association of high fashion with femininity, the designers embodied both through their design and through their um, own self, right, turned the career woman from uh, being a threat to a positive and a fashionable uh, figure. Um, yet in uh, presenting uh, the female designer as a desirable role model uh, to the average consumer, magazine did not just popular fashion design as a career path for women, but careers in general. Uh, paid woman labor was recognized um, not only as a temporary stage in women's lives, but really, um, or as a marker of working class status, but really as a desirable path uh, for the middle class woman. Um, but it is important to remember that while uh, women dressmakers and later in the 20th century uh, fashion designers uh, were certainly making a place for themselves in the industry, uh, the majority of women who worked um, in the fashion industry uh, were not designers, right? Um, but really industrial garment worker um, who really worked for wages um, and uh, were even more anonymous than, uh, than the designers themselves and never received the fame uh, the designers uh, got. Uh, these women, uh, despite being exploited in many ways, um, they had much more influence on the changing fashion, um, on the other hand. Um, so uh, their place in the fashion industry is um, really worthwhile um, to uh, consider. And the rise of the ready-made industry, um, garment industry, which are clothes that are made for wear, right? That you don't really, um, that, this is the majority of the clothes that we buy now, um, right? We don't often time go to a dressmaker that fits our own body, but we're going to a store and buying according to standardized sizes. Um, and there's a problem with that. Everyone who ever looked for a size 10 uh, dress knows that. Um, but, uh, but these women, most of them are immigrants uh, who are, coming from Europe or in the South, African-Americans um, are part of this newly uh, 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 ready-made industry that offer them working possibilities. Um, working in the garment industry does not necessarily meant it was a skilled job, although many immigrants uh, did come uh, with dressmaking skills from Europe. Uh, but the way the industry work um, is that oftentimes uh, you don't uh, sew the garment from the beginning to the end. So um, most of the time, uh, the fitters and the cutters um, and who are usually men um, because they need to um, operate heavy machineries. And these are kind of like the best paying jobs, not surprisingly, in the industry. Uh, they were the ones who cut the fabric according to the patterns. And then uh, the sewers and finishers, who were mostly women, uh, did the job. So they saw uh, the sleeve, the bodice, the collar, um, and one person kind of like sew everything together. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of like a very uh, industrial kind of like... Uh, uh, tailorist uh, notion of, of how to make a garment, right? There's no, a lot of creativity uh, going into that. Um, but, um, but it was a way for these women uh, to be part of that industry. And um, many of them are working in the big factories, certainly at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, most of the work is being done in factories. 
Um, but uh, there were also uh, the possibility of working um, at home or at home sweatshops. Um, this was mostly um, uh, a favorable thing uh, for more older women um, or mothers who had children and could do this work while staying at home taking care of small children. Um, unlike factories in which the um, the work was oftentimes in hourly wages or daily wages. Um, the uh, work in uh, sweatshops was um, piece rate. So you would be paid on how many uh, items you would sew, which is low, lesser wages. Um, and in the factories, it was mostly young women and unmarried women ranging in ages from 14 to 29, where in the period before kind of like the abolishment of child work. Um, and that was something that a lot of young unmarried uh, immigrants uh, came to do in this new country. Uh, but many uh, of these young women actually preferred uh, factory work, um, not only because it was better paid, uh, but uh, mostly because it gave them a chance uh, to really socialize outside of their home and with their own peers, right? In their own age, it gave them a sense of solidarity and um, a way to form those friendships uh, with women in their age and outside of their parental uh, supervision. Um, so despite the work being very exploitive, uh, many young women actually um, prefer um, this um, factory environment over the, the home. And the most popular item that these women uh, sewed in the factories was uh, the shirtwaist. Uh, sorry, that's another example of kind of like how those factories uh, look like. And you can see it's not the most fun place to work for oftentimes 14 or 16 hours a day. Um, that's another kind of like, it's not an easy work by any means. So the shirtwaist um, was kind of, is it this, feminine version of a male dress shirt. And it really was the item that revolutionized the industry, becoming one of the first female fashion items to be mass produced. Unlike complicated uh, structured dresses, which needed to be fitted into the individual body, um, the shirtwaist did not require close fitting and thus was um, more easier to standardize both in style and in sizes. Uh, changes in styles over the years or over the seasons were rarely subtle. Um, they were easy to update it without investing a lot in production costs or a lot of money. Um, the shirtwaist was marketed as suitable for all occasion, for work, uh, for shopping, for afternoon wear, and was particularly appealing uh, for wage earning women um, who could appear to have a diverse wardrobe, right? But without investing in a lot of funds uh, because the versatility of this shirtwaist allowed women uh, to construct a wardrobe in which they could um, switch um, between uh, a, a few uh, shirtwaists uh, at a time, one skirt and a few shirtwaists or vice versa, and really um, creating this idea that I have a lot of clothes to wear, even though it might not be the truth. Um, but more importantly, uh, the avail availability of this um, ensemble of shirt and skirt um, also contributed to a new conception of the female body, which was much more athletic and much more mobile. Um, and with this increasing participation of women in sports and leisure, um, the shirtwaist and the skirt ensemble now model after um, a relatively uh, short bicycle skirt, uh, constructed uh, a new experience, but also a new modern understanding of womanhood. And while difference in quality and durability were certainly obvious between a, a store-bought shirtwaist and a custom-made one, and among uh, manufactured um, shirtwaist in different grades, um, the availability of the shirtwaist to cross uh, both class and racial barriers 
and to become a uniform of the American woman and really to symbolize the ideal American woman uh, made it extremely useful for women from marginalized group to use it in their claim um, to participate in American culture as equals. Um, African-American women um, in particular utilize this respectable connotation of the shirtwaist and their association with collegiate culture to promote racial equality and inclusion in American society. And by appearing fashionable and up-to-date style that matched the mainstream trends, Black women were able to present a model of femininity that challenged racist stereotypes in the, in the white media while simul simultaneously redefining what Black womanhood and making it modern, right? And working class white immigrants, um, many of them who worked in the garment industry, also uh, capitalize on the shirtwaist popularity in their claims for inclusion in American society and their right as workers. Uh, more than anything, uh, the shirtwaist symbolized working class women's growing politicized presence in the workforce. Um, Clara Lemlick, which you can see here, for example, who was a shirtwaist West maker and uh, a union activist who was one of the leaders of the very famous 1909 garment worker strikes known as the uprising of the 2000, really utilized um, the shirtwaist imagery to make claims for her right, both as a woman and as a worker by demanding her right to be acknowledged as a fashionable uh, person, Lamlik and her peers um, intertwine ideas of fashionability and femininity with demands for workers' rights. Yet beyond the shirtwaist, uh, women workers also uh, fought for comfortable clothing that would allow them to navigate uh, dirty streets and factory floors. Um, the problem of long and trailing skirts was a serious concern for women in the 19th century. Um, streets were much more dirtier <laughs> hundred years ago. And this was both a health concern. Um, you could really get sick and die from a wet skirt, uh, but also a functional one because you had to go uh, out and about. Um, so influenced by this um, short bicycle uh, skirt um, that uh, became famous. Um, and when we talk short, um, I know that for the 21st century, it doesn't look so short, but uh, for the 19th century crowd, it was definitely a change. Um, and it was definitely uh, a short skirt. Um, it was usually mid-calf, but it was still short. Um, so in 1896, a group of businesswomen uh, from New York City founded the Rainy Day Club um, and is a way to advocate for shorter school skirts, not just for cycling, but also for everyday wear. And seeing the comfort that the short skirt gave um, uh, women when they drove the ride the bicycle, these women who needed to walk and get a, you know, get a buy, in, um, in City Street, view it as a potential solution to the problems and eels of trailing skirts. And they designed this outfit that you can see here um, that included a short skirt reaching up to four or six inches above the ground uh, with a jacket and a boot um, and uh, named it the Rainy Day costume. Um, in the sense that it was not only for rainy days, but really uh, for every day. And club members argued that their outfit was not just a problem, um, uh, an answer to this problem of poor health, uh, but also a beautiful outfit that helped them to convey their own sense of accomplishment as professional career women. Um, another item that was uh, kind of like on the list of women's workers was uh, pockets. Um, uh, something that I think many women in the crowd can uh, identify with. Um, that's another something that uh, an item that women fought for. Uh, pockets were long considered to be a utilitarian um, item in clothing. Uh, but by the 1890s, um, they became really associated with um, 
the feminist rallying cry uh, for women's rights. Uh, one woman described uh, pockets as women's greatest lack and uh, the biggest hindrance to women's progress. Um, according to her, um, the lack of pockets in women's clothes not only made carrying items like handkerchiefs and pocketbooks and um, journals a nuisance, but it also proved a barrier for women intellectual and professional development. Unlike men, this person argued who could carry in their pockets books and a magnifying glass, for example, and thus to enrich their intellectual lives, women were forced to carry heavy bags that enter their movement and, um, and their ability to explore the world. And so this fighting for pockets that actually would carry something um, is a long and um, uh, continuous fight, I think, until today. I mean, a lot of people can, uh, I think a lot of women can identify with the search for a dress with pockets, which is really still a very much radical idea. Um, by 1913, um, uh, pockets would become a metaphor for women's right and for suffrage. Um, the suffragist Alice Dewar Miller in her serious column, Are Women People, published in 1914, this um, piece titled, Why We Opposed Pockets for Women. And in it, um, she mockingly detailed anti-suffragist argument, substituting the word vote for pockets um, in order really to show the absurdity of these, um, uh, of these arguments, but also really uh, to solidify this idea that pockets are uh, one of the one of women's right, right? It's a woman's right claim, and women mobilization um, during World War One uh, brought with it another uh, and really continuing uh, this uh, trend in um, making clothes more comfortable, uh, more suitable for mobile lifestyle that also included work, uh, but it was really only in the 20s uh, with the increasing numbers of women in the white collar um, jobs. It was about 25% uh, of women work workers at the time um, that really got uh, skirts to get shorter, right? The increasing numbers of working women um, triggered a demand both for office wear, but um, also the wages uh, to afford such a wardrobe. Um, so the young liberated flapper also pushed for uh, shorter skirts as a way to uh, uh, show her newly political and social freedom and sexual freedom, as well as their independence. And as young women demanded to celebrate their sexuality, the fashion industry reacted by providing loose rectangular dresses that allowed for movement and mobility and also exposed women knees for the first time in history. And although skirts length, as you can see in the slide, did fluctuate uh, quite a bit uh, during this decade, uh, by 1925, they began their constant tries um, stopping somewhere along the knee um, in 1926. And women stuck to the short skirt um, because it enabled them freedom, but it also because it symbolized this new presence of them in the public sphere. And as you can imagine, not everyone were happy or approved flapper fashions. Um, teachers, for example, um, were under tight, uh, tight scrutiny about what they wore. Um, for those who adopted the flapper fashions or and bobbed their, um, their hair uh, were at risk of getting fired or not to be employed at all. Um, in 1928, Harper's Magazine reported that the school board of Santa Pola, uh, California refused to hire a teacher because of her bobbed hair. And in Hazel Park, Michigan, the school board mandated that all female teacher will wear ankle length um, instead of knee high uh, dresses. Yet women uh, did not give up on their freedom um, that they equated 
uh, with their newly uh, right to vote. And uh, they pushed back against those um, uh, ordinance. Um, some, there were strikers of teachers, um, very interesting uh, politics around there. But really uh, what they, uh, in their claims to kind of like to stick to this, the short skirt, um, they, it's not just about the length of their skirts, but really uh, they justified it in political term. As one um, flapper argued, uh, would we possibly give up the vote or any other right finally obtained after long struggles? Then why give up the comfort, economy, and freedom of movement, which the short skirt has meant to us? And another flapper reminded that modern lives depend simple, simple and convenient clothing. Paris forget that millions of American women are in business and are not going to be pestered by tangling skirts that catches in subway doors, nor sleeves that drag in and out typer, typewriter keys. And this push for more comfortable clothes in the workplace would intensify even more by World War II as more women entered the workforce. Workwear in the 30s also celebrated functionality, being part of this new trend of sportswear that would come to define the essence of the American look. Led by young women, um, who, designers who sought to design clothes for the modern American uh, woman, the on-the-go woman, this new category, despite his name sportswear and its connotation with leisure, uh, really meant casual daytime clothing for women suited mainly for work. Sportswear brought a new design language that was grounded in comfort, movement, functionality, versatility, and accessibility. It included dresses, suits, neats, separates appropriate for a range of activities and time of days, and appealed to diverse social groups in different income levels. These clothes were made of simple, cheap, and durable fabrics that could be mass produced in different price points. And part of it, designers implemented, yes, pockets, trousers, and easily laundered materials in their designs. However, they did not think that comfort or utility should come at the expense of feminine appearance or fashionable taste. Where some sportswear elements were inspired by menswear, the goal was not to imitate men's clothes, but to create feminine styles that could be, sen be sensibly worn at work and not just at the home. By 1941, with the US entry to the war and the need to mobilize women um, in the home front, designers' philosophy on putting on the working woman at the center and that clothing should serve the wearer's needs found expression also in their designs for women's war, war workers and soldiers. Sportswear designers from Muriel King, Elizabeth Haas, and Claire McCurdle to more upscale designers such as Adrienne and Maine Boucher joined the war effort designing uniforms and war clothes for the millions of women who mobilized uh, to war. Dorothy Shaver also enlisted to the war effort when she was appointed as the consultant to the office of the Quartmaster General to oversee the research development and the design of uniform for women. King, uh, for example, created an outfit uh, for women working in aircraft factories. And in order to ensure the best suitable design, King met with Boeing workers in Washington State and Southern California to understand their needs. The result was a tailored sack, slack made of special fabric called Aranas, which was water and dirt resistant. Um, it was machine washable with uh, the durability of denim, but with the feel and appearance of a fine sportswear fabric. The pants were cut um, without any loose ends or cuffs to adhere to safety regulations and also featured large pockets and stitched down pleats for an extra slundering appearance. Um, the slack came together with a shirt and a cap for the total price of $1,685, which is around $250 today, and still a bargain 
uh, for um, a top designer outfit when you think about it. And this war aesthetic of slacks and boxy tailored suits move beyond the realm of war factories and enter really the realm of high fashion. In 1944, Harper's Bazaar featured Claire Potter's velveteen overall slack as cut precisely like a mechanic suit um, in their fashion spread. Titled At Home in Pants, the, the magazine not only situated the overall as a high fashion item, but also alluded to the extent to which trousers has become acceptable wear for casual wear for women. And as casual, practical, and durable clothing became more and more fashionable, the working women who were wearing them also became a fashionable idea. Yet if the war worker wore her, her pants to the factory, it would take um, 20 years more and even longer until she could wear them to the office. The rise of, of the women's movement in the late 60s brought with it changes to women uh, wear in the workplace. Just like in the 20s, young women embraced the shorter length of skirts, adopting the new style of the mini, um, which really became the epitome of this new uh, youth culture and sexual revolution of the 60s. And just like the flapper styles, the mini skirts also proved to be controversial. Some argued that the skirt was unfeminine because it, uh, its lack of modesty. High school and colleges across the country banned the mini skirts, arguing it led to a distraction um, of, them, of fellow students. Um, Republican lawmakers in California barred uh, their employees from wearing mini skirts, uh, which they argue was not a, um, a professional wear for uh, public workers. But um, well, in the early 70s, people did become um, accustomed more uh, to those knee length um, or just above the, lead, uh, the knee hemlines um, of the mini, the very short, hypersexualized uh, micro mini uh, was still a cause of trouble. Um, some businessmen, for sure, um, relished in the view of a secretary um, bending over the bottom of a a drawer of a filing cabinet, uh, but most employers uh, felt really uncomfortable and banned them from the office. Yet, um, if the hypersexuality of the mini uh, was controversial or was a problem, uh, the growing popularity of unisex styles and manly pants for women proved to be even more problematic. By the 70s, Pants and pantsuits became a new symbol of women empowerment and economic independence. Contemporaries uh, were quick to associating wearing a pantsuit or a pair of trousers with a feminist struggle, connecting it to women's demand to gain influence and status in the workplace as career professionals. For some, the demand to wear pants provided an entrance to the movement as they expand their battles over fashion to other realms of life. A union organizer for a distributive Workers of America, for example, credited her feminist politicization to an office fight over secretary's right to wear pants for work. Mobilized by their success, these women also pursued other subversive ideas of feminism, um, such as and to sex discrimination at work, the right um, to be treated with respect or just better wages. But women's decision to adopt pants as part of their working wardrobe was viewed not just as a mere fashion decision, but as a, reflecting, a reflection of a larger social change. And indeed, as more women gain position of power, whether as CEOs, lawyers, and corporate managers, the pants became the new uniform of the modern businesswoman. And while it was only in 1993 where women were allowed to wear uh, pants um, onto the Senate floor, uh, pants quickly became part of the new fashionable vocabulary of the aspiring woman politician and who pushed for women's rights. 
So to conclude, the transformation in women's workwear were not just a result of technological advancements or based on considerations of utility and comfort, but also a result of women pushing for these, changing, for these changes, seeing their clothes as a mirror of their social status in society. The fashion industry offered women a, a route for economic independence, a profession, but also a way to define and redefine for themselves what women's work mean and what a woman's worker look like. And as we're continuing to be in the midst of this pandemic and another period of great social change, and as work routines are again uh, being uprooted and redefined, we're only left to wonder what the future will hold. But as long as women uh, will be part of the workforce, um, I think we'll always have a say in what they wear. So again, I would be happy to answer any questions um, you might have and a quick reminder um, of how you can uh, get my book. And again, you can email me at exr187 at case.edu um, if you are uh, looking for a, a signed book plate um, of the book. So thank you so much. And uh, that was absolutely first rate. Fascinating. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it. And I expect everybody uh, who's been watching did as well. We have a question here. Um, many of the women workers that you've talked about came from the working class or were African Americans. How do you get information about their lives and their work and what they wore? Yeah, so it's it's um, it's a great question, and um, it is not as easy as you think it is. Um, most of the items in uh, costume collections that we have around museums uh, across the country are oftentimes uh, do belong to more elite and middle class uh, because these are the women who donated clothes. These are the women who. Um, who had clothes to donate, right? When you think about, uh, we usually, what we donate, what, what clothes do we keep? So we keep our wedding dress, we keep um, our, you know, clothes that are really sentimental uh, to us that has sentimental value, but you won't, you know, keep your pajamas or your underwear, right? Or donate it to a museum. So sometimes it's really hard to get into what everyday wear looked like, especially for women who, and, and the shirt waist that working class women were not very durable. They did, they uh, fell apart uh, very quickly, even on um, their own bodies, just because of laundering. Um, it, it's not the, the, the clothes that usually museum um, collect, but we do have photographs. We do have fashion magazines. And these women did read it. We do have also uh, catalogs like Sears that gives us more uh, idea of what kind of like the everyday woman uh, was purchasing, what was the fashion at the time. Um, so that gives us a kind of like another look. Um, and women themselves, I mean, not every woman kind of like wakes up in the morning and writing a manifesto or what she wears every day. Uh, but some women uh, did mention their shopping trips uh, or a special gift that they got or a special dress that they, you know, if they uh, saved um, and skipped uh, lunch for a month to buy a really great hat that they saw or a dress that they saw, they will write it and mention it in their uh, diaries. So those, or their letters, so those are ways for us to get to, to understand what ordinary women wore, um, that oftentimes their clothes are not kind of like, unfortunately, get into museums. And now here's another one. Um, this is from Nancy Troy. Can you connect the length of hems to the economic ups and downs over the years? So I think this is part of uh, one of the most famous urban legends. There are, I mean, uh, some some guy uh, made that um, argument in the in the thirties that that you can see uh, women's hemlines in correlation to the stock market, uh, but it's actually not true. <laughs> 
um, there is difference. And I think there is um, uh, a continuation that um, hemlines fluctuate, but, but the overall trend is to get uh, to have a comfortable length. We need to remember that the micromene um, is not, shorter is not necessarily more comfortable, right? And, and even with the mini, uh, many more older women or women who, uh, who were, uh, uh, worked in kind of like corporate uh, jobs were not comfortable with the micro mini themselves. They said, well, we always now have to have a scarf to kind of like cover our knees because it's too, or I cannot sit with the micro mini because it's too revealing. So we need to remember that shorter is not necessarily uh, more comfortable or more liberating always, um, but women are always trying to uh, figure out what is the best length. I think for them and what works for them. And I think that it's something that we can really draw a line between the 19th century to today. Um, here is, is one that ties in with that theme, but it's not length of costume, it's pockets. Um, we have questions from Sarah Lynn Cunningham and from um, um, Rachel G. Why do women's clothes still not have pockets like men's clothes do? Why didn't they have pockets in the first place? And then Sarah Lynn says, we need deeper, more functional pockets still today. Can you help us with this pockets problem? Yes. No, I really do think that Pockets is still the rallying cry of women um, across this across the world, really, um, and that's what we still kind of like our flag of feminism and suffragism. Uh, we can still carry uh, to today. Um, women uh, did not have uh, originally had pockets um, because they didn't need it. Right, um, the notion was that. Uh, for a dress just needed to be beautiful. It didn't need to be functional. It, need, it didn't need to be uh, uh, suitable uh, for work. Um, so it only when women did start to gain and said, wait a minute, we do need functional clothing to, to get by, uh, that pockets really became something uh, that designers started to think about. And if you can see, I mean, and it is interesting, uh, women designers oftentimes do include long, deep pockets, utilitarian pockets in their design. It's men who still... Oops, you're stuck. Well, in actuality, it is 101 and a knob is uh, frozen. Uh, hopefully not in anyone's pockets, but we just really want to thank you and our entire audience for uh, streaming in today with us. If you have follow-up questions, uh, Inov has agreed to take them. All you need to do is just email them to her, and uh, we will post that if we haven't already. Once again, Thank you. Oh, here she is. Anoff. Oops, put you, uh, unmute Sorry yourself. There that. you are. Sorry for that. No, 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 no. I was just wrapping up. Um, let's have one more question. And that is, sure. what is the effect of um, movie stars, say a Katherine Hepburn, for example, on the fashion industry? Yes, so definitely um, we do think about women like Katrin Hepburn, like Marlon Dietrich, uh, Greta Garbo, um, these uh, uh, movie stars of kind of like Hollywood uh, golden era uh, had immensely uh, uh, influence over fashion. Uh, many of them did also promote those American designers uh, that I was talking about. They were their friends, they insisted of hiring them uh, both on and off screen. So this is why we do see uh, more sportswear in kind of like the, the movies of the 30s and 40s. Um, and these, um, but also earlier stars, what happened was that uh, stars oftentimes had to buy their own dress. 
uh, to whether the theater or uh, the movies. And uh, so they had their own taste really impacted what designers wore and then what the public wore because they were kind of like the role models for these women. Um, so even though they didn't work in factories, um, most of these women did came Hepburn had a suffragist mother um so she was really into feminist politics and many of them kind of like said we're not we want to wear nice clothes but also comfortable clothes and um and 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 they kind of like made the industry the the studios um to uh to 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 allow them to wear uh, those clothes that they want to wear, um, so they too, um, you know, uh, maybe not directly, but also had a lot of influence on the on the fashion industry and in styles as well. Excellent job. Will you take questions by email? Sure. And right. everybody wants to contact me. They're welcome to do that. And um, so my email again is exi exr187, I would put it in the chat, at case.edu. Um, and you're welcome um, to reach me. Is that C-A-Z-E dot Oh, case, sorry. That's what happened when you, when you type fast. Glad, I'm glad I caught that one. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, everyone, thank you so much. And again, I hope that we'll be able to see all of you live and in person starting on March 1st. We'll keep you posted as we uh, collectively get through this latest uh, version of the global pandemic. Thank you, Anav. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Keep safe and healthy. Yeah, keep safe.